Hi, welcome to episode five of Vegetables Matter. This is a craft cast, which is a new name. Um, I got that from Kalisha um, or Nadira Tani from the Quirky Monday podcast. Um, so this is a craft cast um, about fiber stuff, um, primarily spinning, knitting, crocheting, and dyeing. Um, but other little bits and pieces as well. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm really, I think this is gonna be a really interesting episode. Um, I have, yeah, I just have some, some really interesting stuff to talk about. I have um, a little bit of spinning, some dyeing, a couple whips, and then, let's see, sorry, what else? I actually already recorded all of this and then realized that it wasn't recording, so I'm getting to repeat it all. So, um, let's see. I'm forgetting now my beginning. Oh yeah, whips and then some cool new yarn that I just had made, yarn and roving um, that I just had processed. And then I'm going to talk about some um, a Navajo weaving project film project I'm gonna talk about it Navajo weaving is gonna be really cool um, at the end and we also have a giveaway very exciting um, okay so to start off let's start with some spinning um, I have one finished object I have a few other little things but I didn't bring them out to show this is kind of my my big thing um, this is kind of a chunky two-ply, and it is a Rambouillet Corriedale Columbia cross. I got this roving, or top. It says roving, but it seems like top. Um, I got it from my local yarn store, and they said, like, this was the the tag on it. Yikes. The tag on it, it was just kind of this handwritten thing. Um, but they were able to tell me the, the breeds of the sheep, and they say that the people who do lamb's pride yarn, which is um, that 85% wool, 15% mohair stuff um, I've worked with a couple times, that they are out in Nebraska, and I guess they have some sheep, and they also like produce a little bit of roving stuff. So anyway, interesting, because it's not like officially labeled or anything, but it's really fun to work with. Um, it's got like some nice little stretch going on to it. Um, yeah, pretty fun little project. So the plan for this is that it will go with last month's big finished spinning project. Um, this is some Jacob. And then I need to spin up some like almost black alpaca that I have as well. So these will be the things. So this gray and then that almost black. And then the plan is to dye this red with matter root. Um, and this will be for my sister for a knitting, a project that then she will knit. Um, she'll make a little poncho thing. Anyway, so it's fun to be making some progress on that and really getting these together. I'm going to wait. I'm going to try to wait for her to do the, the, dying together she's interested in being part of that so um and she's in oregon so i'm not quite sure when that'll happen i think in, in my dream one time it happened but um it is not reality so there's that next up some dying i've had um three dye baths this month oh i should say also it's february 28th today um and i don't think that i'm gonna be able to have time to edit this um for a week but I just wanted to at least record it today. But today, February 28th, is my grandma's birthday. And if she were still alive, she would be 99 today. So that's fun and exciting. She was actually my last grandma to pass away. And yeah, it was a really, really crazy shift, you know, not having any grandparents anymore and realizing, wow, I'm, I'm the second generation now. Um, and my parents are elders at this point, so. Yeah, kind of a crazy, crazy transition when that happens. Um, I really felt that. Oh darn, I already did this for the dying and now everything's in the reverse order in the basket. So, um, dying. 
in 2016, um, I had a friend travel across the country and um, visit. And on her way, she stopped in some mountains and gathered some lichen. And she let me have some of the lichen um, for dyeing purposes. And let's see, the lichen is called rock tripe. And it gives some really beautiful pinks and purples, fuchsia colors, um, which I don't have. <laughs> um, so you're supposed to like have it in a jar with ammonia and water and then shake it and aerate it every week. And within like three to six months, it's supposed to turn from like a brownish color to like a deep grape juice purple color. But mine kept not turning that color. And it's been two and a half years. And I, th I think the reason is that it says to like, just kind of loosely put the lichen in the, in the jar. And I put a lot of lichen in the jar. So I just don't think there was enough space for it to aerate, it was just really dense, and so it's been taking a long time. It's finally been turning purple, and so I thought, okay, let's try it. I don't know if it's quite purple enough yet, but I'll try it and at least even use up a little bit of it, and then maybe it can aerate a little bit more. Um, so I did a little dye bath with that, and this is the result. I can't really see my screen very well, so I have no idea how the color is picking up or not. Um, these are actually two slightly separate things. This one is dyed just on white Lincoln, like this, okay, just white. Um, and the other is over dyed on some of this um, kind of light pink. This is also the Lincoln, but it was dyed in a cochineal dye bath last year sometime at a friend's house. Um, and it, it turned out just rather pale, um, which just isn't quite my thing. I was wanting a little bit deeper color. I do have some of it, actually. Here it is. That is a little bit of that, those deeper pinks. So um, I think I'll keep this as is, but I had quite a bit of it. And so I thought, oh, it could be fun as I'm doing some other pinkish colors to try over dyeing. So that's what I've been doing. And I'm getting all confused. So this is just over white, and this, there is kind of this pink undertone to it. I don't know if you can see it at all, but this is dyed over that pink. This actually was a lot darker than this one, um, but then I ended up taking this one out, and this, there just still seemed like there was some dye stuff in it, so I just left the, this one in for longer and like simmered it again a little bit. Um, and so it, it deepened up to being pretty close to the same, but just a little bit more orangey. Um, whereas this kind of has that pink hue to it. So this is what I got from it. Um, not quite the, the fuchsia colors that you really can get from it, but some pretty colors nonetheless. So that is one of the dye baths. The next dye bath was um, an idea I got from a dye calendar that I have. Um, Fran, I'm not sure her last name, Fran something. Um, she has a blog at wooltribulations.blogspot.com and she does a lot of dyeing in there and um, yeah really lays things out really well and she kind of experiments and kind of shows like oh when I tried it like this it was this and this and just has it all laid out really well and she also has a dye calendar and I got one for myself and my friend this year and in February she talks about dyeing with silver birch bark we don't have silver birches in Utah um, I guess it's like a really common tree in England, British Isles, um, but we don't have them here. But she also says that most fruit trees contain dyes in their bark as well, in the peelings. Um, so I thought, okay, let's try it. I have eight trees um, that I planted in my backyard, although one of them died last year, um, so I'll replace that one this year. But yeah, I just did a little bit of pruning. They're all kind of these baby trees still, just... Um, some of them have given fruit yet, some of them haven't yet. Um, but just, they're, they're all different. So I have apricot, nectarine, apple, peach, a dead cherry tree, almond, Asian pear, and Bartlett pear. Um, yeah, so I just kind of did some trimmings of them, kind of peeled them, or they were all such fine little, little twigs anyway. I was even just kind of like scrunching them up and just sort of releasing that. You let it ferment for a week and then simmer your yarn in it. 
Um, and I didn't, <clears throat> this isn't mordanted at all because um, it has the tannins and the bark, so I didn't do anything extra. Um, this stuff I actually just rinsed yesterday. I found that it's a lot more effective, um, especially with natural dyeing, if you let, like, if instead of after dyeing, rinsing it right away, if you let it just like sit for maybe a week to a month and then you rinse it, um, it just kind of lets that color penetrate deeper in. So um, these had been sitting for a little while and I just rinsed them yesterday. They still actually feel kind of stiff, so I think I'm going to rinse them a little bit more, but this is what I've got for these. Um, so I must have done the same thing where this must be the white and then this is over dyed um, over the pink. So, anyway, some similar colors. There they are. The third dye bath I did was with rose petals. Um, Kalisha, or Nadir Tani, from the Quirky Monday podcast, she was doing, a couple weeks ago, she had like a solar dye jar that she had put like some rose petals in, and I'd never heard of dyeing with rose petals before. So, um... I actually, um, for Valentine's Day, my husband gave me some roses. It's actually the first time I've ever received flowers from a romantic partner. <laughs> um, yeah, he was really cute when he brought them to me. He was like, it only took me 10 years, but here they are. <laughs> so um, anyway, it was pretty fun to, to get some flowers. And they were lovely, and then as they were wilting, I thought, oh, I've recently heard about dying with roses, um, and let's give it a try. I couldn't find a lot of info online about it, which kind of made me think that it wouldn't necessarily work that well. Um, but I gave it a, a shot. I kind of kept it at a low but hot temperature for, you know, an hour or something to really get the, the color out. I didn't do solar dye and it's been cold. <laughs> Not a lot of heat happening, so I just wanted to do it on the stove. Um, and then I was wanting to use the Lincoln that all of this is, is done with, but as I was getting everything prepared, I realized, oh, with rose petals, I'm sure you need mordanted fiber. And I didn't have any Lincoln that was pre-mordanted and I just wanted to make it easy for myself. And so um, I just grabbed some of this Targi that was already mordanted. This has not yet been rinsed. Um, it's kind of an odd color. There's, it's kind of this like yellowish color, not super exciting yellow, but just, um, yeah, it's mostly that color. There's like this hue of purple on it, which is, which is pretty, but I, I imagine it's going to wash right off. And even if it doesn't, it's very much just on the surface. Like when I look at kind of pulling it apart and actually spitting with it there it's mostly just yellow anyway there's a bit of purple hue in it anyway so that is what roses did for me not a super exciting thing but it was fun to try um <coughs> it actually is kind of fine that this didn't work out that well because i was thinking it would be really fun to spin this stuff up and then maybe next year around Valentine's Day to make some project with these different hues of pink. Maybe some like Fair Isle hat or something. I don't know. Um, and this is not done from the same fiber anyway and I don't know. I'm kind of a purist. Um, so so this will probably just be something totally different instead. Um, but yeah, there's kind of all these pretty little pink colors in here. So that is dyeing and spinning. So I had been wanting to make some thrummed mittens for quite a while now. I think last year I did, but it just didn't happen. I didn't know what to make it with. Um, <clears throat> but I think in like my December podcast, I talked about this plan. I was given this really beautiful gray yarn, um, which is a Columbia and Columbia cross sheep. Um, I'd been given this yarn, a skein, of worsted weight, 100 yards, by some friends, um, and it was so beautiful, and I was so excited by it. I, I had these, this is also Targi, um, these different colors that I had dyed, and I just thought, wow, that looks so pretty with that, and I think these would really make good thrums. Um, wouldn't it be fun to make some thrummed mittens? But realized that I didn't have enough yarn for that. But then I had another aha moment, and I thought, oh, 
let's contact the farm. Um, they're up in Idaho and see if I can get more of it. So I did that, kind of took a while, um, but I got another skein of it and cast on for thrummed mittens. This is, I don't quite know how I feel about this project. In some ways I love it, but I also just keep not really wanting to knit on it. So I think it's mostly because I've just been in this weird funk. I don't think it's these, I actually love them. Although, I have been having a little bit of troubles with the thrums, I would say. Um, mine don't look like little beautiful hearts, you know, like a little lice stitch. They just are little polka dots, which I think is cute, but I just don't know why I can't get it to look like everyone else's looks like. So, um, I actually knit this first and then ripped it back and then knit this and then wanted to rip it back, but just thought, let's just start a new one instead. You can see I did a different cuff than this, so I will rip this back. And I was just trying different techniques to get the thrums to work. Um, anyway, these really should be done by now, but I just, I've been in a bit of a funk. Um, like, literally, this last row I finally finished yesterday, and it, it took me three days to do one row on worsted weight mittens. So, um, <laughs> funk, funk, funk. Um, but I'm working on getting out of it. So, anyway, this is a fun project, super cute. Um, I guess this one you can kind of see a little bit more, those colors popping out. Um, yeah, they're fun, I'm excited about them. Oh, one last little thing, just um, these three colors are are dyed, are hand dyed, um, and it's kind of fun. They're all not like the primary dye bath, but after I like took out the, the primary, you know, yarn, then I was like, oh, it looks like there's still plenty of color in there. Let's throw in something else. And so these are all just kind of some seconds. Um, this is red onion skins. This is red onion skins in an iron pot. And this is it's a little bit hard to tell, but this does have a slight blue color to it. Um, this is Hopi sunflower seeds. Hopi black sunflower seeds. Anyway, I think they're pretty together. It's working well. Next whip is the blanket that I showed last time. Um, I was really working like crazy on this for a while. <clears throat> and I have quite a bit of progress. Dun, 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 dun. So this is the Turtle Tracks blanket by someone. I I have not been working on this. Like I really was for a while and then I got really bored with it. I'm just like, eh, I'm done. So anyway, I've been focusing on some other things, but I'm finally I'm just feeling like, okay, I think it's blanket time. For some reason I'm in a funk. I think even though I love the mittens, they kind of are putting me not putting me, but they're not helping my funk. Um, and I'm feeling like, I think I just want to like crochet away on this. So this is crocheted. Um, yeah, super fun. Sometimes. It was also really boring. Yeah, if you'd asked me two weeks ago, I just would have said boring, boring, boring. But now, fun, fun, fun. I'm going to start working on it again. Um, last time I told you that this time I would tell you more about the yarn. So... This yarn, I don't know if you can see, it is so interesting and wonderful. So this is just like the overall color of it, but it is just this tweedy yarn that is composed of just the most amazing colors. I mean, up here there's just like so many oranges and yellows and purples and greens, and then down here you get more into like blues and purples and like not as much of the orange, and it's just like, so rich the color there's just so many colors in here that then make this overall color um so it's kind of fun to work with this was given to me by lynn at spinderella's spinderella's is a local small mill in salt lake city which is about an hour from me and when i first found them online a couple years ago they were not accepting any new people um, any new customers. And so it's like, okay, well, that's that. 
but recently um, I was looking at them again and discovered that they are now accepting new customers um, and I had found a number of fleeces in the shed that were just not even on my radar at all. It's like I have, you know, so many things that are on my radar of just like spin this, spin that, spin this, spin that, and like some of them I'm spinning, but it's just like there's this long line of things that I'm like desperately wanting to get to. And these desperately wanting to get to, but not getting to, right? It's, it's hard to have the time. And this was stuff that I like wasn't even desperately trying to get to. It wasn't even like kind of trying to get to. They were just like in the shed, not on my radar. Um, so I contacted Spinderella's. I guess I should also say there was some inspiration from a couple podcasters who were making yarns. Um, Lage from the Fiber Tales podcast had a bunch of yarn made from her parents' sheep's fleeces. Um, so that was really cool. And then also Emma from the Woolly Mammoth podcast was kind of looking into getting some local bases made for her dyeing stuff and just really having it be being more and more involved in all of that and having to be local. Um, so that was really cool seeing them do it and then I came across the stuff and there was a mill that was accepting people and I just thought let's try it. <laughs> um, let's let's not let this stuff just sit in my shed doing nothing. Let's make it usable. So I went up to Spinderella's um, to get the stuff processed. I dropped that stuff off and I do have it back now and I'm going to show it to you. I'm really excited about it. But Lynn was so kind and nice um, and she like sh she gave me a little tour of um, of her mill and on their website they say they don't give tours but then I, I kind of was like well you know like I, I know you don't and she's like oh we can make exceptions and she brought me back there and showed me and it was super sweet and nice. Um, and as I was leaving, then we kind of saw that she just had like this large bag that had a bunch of this yarn in it. And she gave me one. She gave me just like, she like wraps them in these giant like pound things of them. And they end up having like four or five skeins in them, but it's like wrapped up in this pound thing. Um, and then she actually ended up giving me a second one as well. So she gave me like two pounds of this stuff. Isn't that awesome? So in her mill, she has like this big blue barrel and she just kind of throws like scraps in there and then like when she's, you know, playing around with stuff and just like wanting to add a little bit of color, a little bit of something, then she just like grabs stuff from this scrap bucket. So I don't totally know. This is kind of like the story in my head, but I could be a little bit wrong about this. I think she just decided to like empty the, the barrel um, and just like made all of this yarn. So it's just like all of these scraps just all thrown in together and voila here is this yarn um, so I immediately found a pattern and kind of started working with it um, yeah it's super fun super nice thank you Lynn I really really appreciate it um, I'm on I believe my third skein of yarn and I have a total of eight so I'm just going to make it as big as I can. This will have a border that goes all the way around it. So it's a small blanket, you know, it's a little lapgan, um, but it will be wider than it is now. Um, yeah. Ta-da! Okay, so that brings us to the stuff that Lynn made for me. Um, Let's see, let's start off with this. So I have about two and a half pounds of this beautiful Icelandic lopi. It's kind of this chunky single. Um, this fleece was given to me by, by my brother-in-law. Um, he is a gunsmith and he does lots of trades, and so someone had some sheep, and they said, oh, would you take this for posting this thing? And he said, sure. Um, and then he gave it to me. So, um, yeah, this is really fun, and it's just so beautiful. It's, you know, kind of black, but then has, like, all these white hairs in it as well. So it just kind of, like, has this heathered black look to it. Um, really pretty. I'm really, I, you know, it just seems perfect to make this cozy Icelandic sweater with a gorgeous yoke in it. 
Um, the problem with that is that I only have this color of it, um, and I have like some hand spun Icelandic, but it's just a very different feel than this, um, different size, weight, you know, all of that. So I really would like to get more Icelandic made um, in like a light fleece that then I can dye some different colors and have a really pretty yoke. So I'm super excited to work with this, but it's not quite ready yet. Um, although a friend, we had gone in and gotten a couple Icelandic fleeces um, together and I've spun all of mine up and have a sweater out of it plus some other stuff. Um, but she just hasn't really taken up spinning particularly. And so I, I knew, you know, I just thought, oh, you know, she has all of that fleece. I'm looking for some Icelandic fleece. I should see if I could buy it off of her. Um, and she was happy about that arrangement as well, although she was really kind and um, didn't want me to pay for it as well. So I have that. I have that that hopefully can then become part of this project. Um, the hesitation with it is that I don't think I quite have three pounds of it, and there are three pound minimums, so I would have to pay for three pounds. Um, so maybe I just need to get another fleece and then have it be a bigger batch or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, sorry, I'm always just like picking a little things. I have a hard time sitting still. Ooh, this is why I'm constantly knitting and spinning and all those things because. It helps me. <laughs> um, but hello, hello, I'm focused. Um, anyway, this is fun and lovely. Voila, I think that's all about that. Next up, I have some awesome core spun alpaca, mostly alpaca. I had had, you know, just a bunch of alpaca seconds that I wasn't excited about at all. It's just like, I don't want to spin that. I want to spin really nice stuff. I, I think when I first started getting into spinning, it's just like, oh, spin everything. And now it's just like, no, I want to spin really nice stuff. It takes a long time and I just want it to be as good as it can be really. So I had all of these second cuts and I was just like, what am I going to do with these? I don't know, you know, but I found out you can just like turn it into this. Isn't it awesome? This is like six and a half pounds, I want to say. Mm, it's lovely. It's mostly alpaca, so I had this gray. I must have had some white, some black. Yeah, black. There's definitely black in there. It's funny. There's not much black. I'm surprised. Um, and then also that other Icelandic fleece. So there was this one, but then there was a smaller white one that had quite a short staple length. Um, and just didn't seem worth it to like do anything else with and then we thought oh we could just throw it in with this kind of help the alpaca stick together a little bit better um, and just you know bulk this out so um so this is alpaca and a little bit of icelandic core spun so there's a cotton core in the center of it um i'm very excited about this i want to weave it i've seen people do other things like crochet or um what do people call it? It's like Amish rugs, except it's not actually Amish. And there's another name like toothbrush rugs or something, because people can use like an, an old toothbrush to, as their tool for it. <clears throat> um, I've seen stuff like that. I don't like the look of it quite as much as just like, like a woven rug. So I just want to weave it. I have different ideas and plans for how to make that happen. I'm not particularly a weaver. I've done a little bit of weaving. I don't have a loom, except I do sort of have a loom, but I don't know how to use the loom that I have, but I'm working on that. Um, so hopefully soon there will be progress with this because it's super inspiring to just make rugs out of this stuff. <laughs> yes. <sighs> this feels good. I haven't really looked at it for a while. My baby. Um, here I go again. Here I go again. Picking out the little VM. Vegetables matter. <laughs> um, one thing that's holding me back from doing this is that I don't have... the dogs are reacting to something happening at the neighbors. Um, 
I don't have warping yarn. So that's what I'm trying to fix. Um, today I am going to be driving to Durango. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I'm thinking that I want to look up yarn stores in Durango and see if there's maybe one that's like centered or focused or catering towards weavers um, and check them out and see if I can't find like a nice woolen warp. Something that would be wool. I want wool. I do. Um, with like some extra twist or something to be a good warp for this. Um, so hopefully I'll be finding something to further this project because I've been really wanting to just like try warping Navajo style but I don't have anything to work with so I can't. Um, okay there's that. Next up I got a bunch of roving made. Um, I kind of put a bunch of it into like little balls like this. This is Navajo churro. Um, it's this giant fleece. It's not. It's pretty giant. I have three and a half pounds of this, I want to say. So a lot of roving. Um, and I'd already spun up some of it as well. Um, yeah. So lots of roving. Lots and lots of roving. That is what I want to start spinning next. Once, okay, with spinning, I found that it's nice to do like a bigger spinning project and then like some smaller projects. You'll, you've noticed when I do dyeing, I'm, I'm really just experimenting and I just have these like small chunks that are dyed. And so I found it was really fun in between these. So I did this and I was like, okay, something different. I'm tired of that. Um, and so I just brought out like a few of the, um, the smaller bunches of, of hand dyed stuff and just spun those up real quick. And then I did this and I feel ready to just, okay, let's just, you know, use up and kind of, you know, cause like right now I just have like all these little bits of, of stuff. And so it's like, use it up, you know, get it a little bit more manageable before I cast, cast on, before I start spinning the next thing. Um, so I want to spin up potentially some of the pink stuff that I have. Um, but then after that, kind of the next bigger project, I think will be some churro. I want to use some of this stuff up, see how it is, because I do want to try selling some of this. I forget if I said that in this version that I actually recorded. Um, you know, it was pretty pricey to get all of this stuff made, and so I would like to try selling some of it to help kind of cut those costs and make it so that I can continue um, getting stuff made by Spinderella's. Um, so I'd like to spin with it before I try selling it just to see, you know, how exactly is it. There, There is still um, some VM in it. So, <clears throat> you know, just get some more personal experience so that I know what I'm selling. So, I'll spin up some pink stuff and then some churro and then some of that black alpaca. That's the list so far and who knows what, all, what else will warm its way in there. The churro is a fleece that I got at the Navajo, or Diné, um, is the term that they call themselves. Diné, Sheep is Life Festival. Not last summer, but the summer before. 2017? I wanna say, 2017, um, down in Arizona. I got to go to that, very cool. So, and that leads us into this next thing. And Durango. So I've kind of been alluding around it, but you haven't known yet. So today I'm going to Durango, Colorado for the Durango Film Festival. Um, my husband does film work when he can. Um, and we have a friend who lives in Durango, Larry Ruiz, who has made a film about Navajo weaving. It is called Spider Woman's Web. My husband is the cinematographer and I have done a lot of the audio um, for the film. And it is premiering today. Very exciting. Um, we're actually not going to be able to make it to the premiere. Um, 
but there will be another viewing on Saturday. So that's the plan. I'm really excited. I think it's really cool. I think Larry has done a really awesome job. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this project that we've been working on the past couple years. Um, it's been so amazing to get to work on. Larry has taken it on and he gets to do all the hard stuff. And then we just get to show up and do all the fun stuff. So <laughs> thanks Larry, it's been so good. Um, I'm going to link, or I'll, I'll put a link um, below for the trailer for the film. Um, there's actually two trailers. There's one that's three minutes, three and a half minutes, and there's one that's maybe like a minute and a half. The minute and a half one doesn't have anything that the, th the three and a half minute one doesn't have. So if you watch the, the longer one, you don't really need to watch the shorter one. But if you only have a minute and a half, check that one out too. Um, okay, so I'll link that so that you can see a little bit. Um, so I would say the original plan or idea that he had for the film was kind of, I think, maybe what you would think of if you think of Navajo weaving, you know, like trading post and maybe like older weavers and it's like dying out or something like that. Um, but it didn't turn into that at all. It turned into something else and it's so cool. Um, Dawood, my husband and I, we were coming back from a trip and we like randomly stopped by Mesa Verde National Monument. Um, it was kind of random. <laughs> we, we, we like had an extra day, which never happens. And we were passing Mesa Verde and we thought, we have a National Parks Pass, let's just go. So we went. Kitty cat, come in. Um, What was I saying? Oh yeah, Mesa Verde. So we go up there, we get to the parking lot. It's quite a drive up the Mesa, you know. Um, we get to the parking lot. I remember I was knitting on my Icelandic sweater that I've alluded to today. Um, we get to the parking lot. We go. I go to the bathroom. When I come out, my husband's like kind of down under this thing and he's like, hey, go up there. I'm like, oh, what? Or maybe he was up there and he's like, come on, just like kind of like gesturing for me to like come up or something. So I like come up and as soon as I get up there, I'm like, oh, I know why. There's this park ranger who is drop spinning. I think he's drop spinning. He could have been using a hip spindle, but I feel like he was drop spinning this time. Um, and so, you know, of course I immediately am just like, oh, you know, go over and start talking. <laughs> I'm quite a shy person unless there's fiber, and then I'm just like, ooh, fiber. <laughs> so, um, yeah, normally I don't approach people, but I do approach fiber. I approach fiber, not people. Um, anyway, so it was really fun to chat with him. Um, he is Dene. His name is Venancio Aragon, and it was just really, really great talking to him, and um, he's my age. He's um, just a couple weeks younger than me, actually. And just kind of hit it off with him a little bit. We got his contact info. He told me about the Sheep is Life Festival that year, which would have been 2016. We already had plans around the summer solstice, and we thought, oh, we're not going to be able to make it this year. We'd love to go next year. Um, so we told Larry, who was already beginning, just in the very beginnings of making this Navajo weaving film, we were like, you have to contact this guy. He's great. Um, so Larry did, eventually, and it just brought the direction of the film into this really cool place that is these young Navajo weavers, primarily male, um, but some women as well, and they are just interfacing directly um, with their customers via social media. Um, so they're really just saying, we don't need the middleman trading post that is, and I don't want to be negative either. It's like the trading post has had a place and some people that works for them, but definitely their narrative from what I was hearing from these, from this younger generation is just like, they're, 
the trading post would, would dictate certain styles to people, two gray hills, you know, different things. Um, and they would say, this is this product that this trading post has, and then the, the weavers have to provide this, and then um, they sell it um, that way. And it's just, anyway, so they're just saying, no, that's, that's not what we're doing. And they're just really exploring and creating in so many ways and exploring traditional things and exploring new things and melding the two and just being artists completely. Um, and so many of them are not just weavers. Um, they are spinners and dyers as well. Um, there's actually a part in the film that I really love where Venancio says, you know, to be, to be a good weaver, you don't just need to know how to weave. You have to be a good shepherd. You have to be a good spinner. You have to be a good dyer. And finally, at the very end, you have to be a good weaver. Um, so, oh, just it's been just so incredible to get to spend time with them. And, you know, sometimes I'm just like in my audio mode, you know, doing all of that. But there have been other times where they're just needing B-roll, um, where I've just gotten to like craft and fiber with, with people as well. And it's been a blast. Um, so really enjoyed having that perspective um, the past couple years. Um, one thing I wanted to say with that as well is, you know, I live in Utah and then, you know, Navajo is Four Corners area, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, and water is an important and precious resource. And especially if you're looking at like traditional ways of using fiber you know, you can't just wash a fleece using gallons and gallons of water. It's just, that is ridiculous. You can't do it. And so seeing the ways that people are able to clean, um, to clean their fleeces using a minuscule amount of water. And there's this clay that they can use. There's another, um, another weaver in the film named Zephyrin. And at the Sheep is Life Festival, he was kind of demonstrating um, some of these ways where there's just like this clay with like very little water and you put the fleece in it and maybe you let it soak for a while. And then you just kind of like pull it out, let it dry or something, and then just kind of like shake the clay off of it and it like gets clean. Um, and then, I mean, really, I, I think probably using just a gallon or two of water, he's able to clean multiple fleeces. So um, I've really loved learning some perspectives like that. Because um, yeah, when I when I clean a fleece, I really like I don't I don't use soap, and maybe I have troubles because I don't use soap. But I just I can't really stand having that much water go to waste. And so I really like to just soak it and then I just dump the water out and like, um, I especially like doing it in the summer and then I just give the water to my fruit trees. Um, and I think they really like getting, you know, any little poopy manure bits, you know, as well. It's just like delicious for them. So uh, I really like that cycle and I definitely struggle. I don't struggle, but um, I'm very aware of water when I'm when I'm fibering and after you spin, you're supposed to soak it or something and then like thwack it and different things um, to kind of finish it off. And I will wait for months and months and months because I'm like, I just, you know, then you just like dump the water after I can't do that. And in the winter, I'm not, I, I don't have a place where I can dump the water. I like doing that and then dumping the water in my garden or, you know, giving it to a tree or something like that. Um, and they just don't need it in the winter. So I just have, honestly put off like soaking skeins because I don't want to waste the water. So, um, yeah, water is an important thing. Water is life. <laughs> um, okay, I think that's it with Navajo weaving stuff. Um, last thing, the very last thing, is the giveaway. Um, which I guess is one final little finished object as well. So last time I showed this adorable little snow person. Hello, snow person. Oh, I feel like it got a name a couple weeks ago. I've forgotten. If it did, I don't know what it is anymore. Okay, snow person has a cousin. Dun, 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 dun. Cute little cousin. I love, I don't know if you can quite see it here. 
but these snow people look so different from each other. Oh yeah, you can kind of see. This one has like this funny posture. <laughs> it's like kind of like tall and gangly or something. And this one, they just look so different to me. And I just think it's fascinating to see the different body types of snow people. Who would have known? And like the different faces they have. I don't know. Does it look that different to you? Sorry, I can't figure out how to focus the camera. Um, there we go. So, here it is. There, I got one comment for the giveaway, um, and that happened right away. So, I kind of, you know, I, I knew there was a slight chance that maybe someone would comment um, more, but I didn't really think that would happen. So, it was really fun as I was making this to be making this for, sorry, yeah, this one, to be making this for Annie. My dear and darling friend Annie. Um, is the winner of this giveaway. She commented. She's the only one and she gets this awesome cute little snow person. So dun 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 dun. Mwah, mwah. They'll miss each other. Okay that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Ciao!